I remember um, going to a meeting with my dad, actually, a lunchtime meeting, and he stood up at the table and he had to introduce his guest, which was me. And he goes, uh, this, this is my son, James. Not exactly sure what he does, but evidently it works out really well for him and it's got something to do with the internet. And then we both sat back down and I just chuckled. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. You're listening to part five of a six-part series that I'm doing with my good friend Matthew Paulson. G'day, Matthew. Hey, James. How are you? Good. We're going well so far. Uh, now, if you haven't listened to the first few episodes of this series, I recommend you go back and listen to them. They'll all be linked to in the show notes. Part one was how to grow and monetize an email list of 250,000 emails. Part two was about side projects and why you probably shouldn't do them. That episode had a really big reaction in the internet marketing community, which we're very grateful for. And part three was a website sale case study where you sold a website for $400,000, Matthew, and we broke that down. Part four was all about optimizing your business and how to double revenue if your business is failing or even if it's not in six months or less. Today, we're talking about how to successfully change the name of your business. So, Matthew, why would we want to do this? Well, when you first you know, start your business, you'll pick out a name and sometimes it's not a good name and it takes you a while to figure that out. The name of my business was Analyst Ratings Network. And it doesn't take long to figure out why that's not a good name. You know, there's three words to it. It's hard to pronounce for some people. It's seven syllables long. It just not wasn't a good name. And I didn't realize that because I was never trying to commu- I wasn't communicating it with people verbally. You know, it was all just, you know, through the internet. So, you know, an email you can get it, but you know, the repeatability of that name was was not good. What kind of came to a head and, and made me decide to change the name? I went to a conference called MicroConf, and I was talking to people about the name, about my business, you know, what it does. And whenever they would repeat the name back to me, they would get it wrong. I would hear analyst network, you know, analyst ratings, but I would never hear the full name. And it just happened over and over and over again. And I thought, you know, hey, this is this is a problem. If you know people that are you know other entrepreneurs can't get the name right, I doubt my customers are too. And you know that kind of kind of sealed the deal and I figured, you know, I need a better name for this business. Right. You know, it's a it's a pretty common thing where we have a suboptimal name. I've had a few names, a uh, similar thing. I have had a website development company and it was called ATL Web and a lot of people were calling it Alt Web. So it was mm. probably because ALT is some kind of a keyboard maneuver and uh, yeah. ATL Web originally was sort of a short code for Atlanta, but people outside the USA don't know what short codes for states are. People inside the mm-hmm. USA were still preferred out than ATL. In the end, I decided mm-hmm. to move that back to the mothership and uh, change it. But I've had much better success with other names that are so much more obvious. Super fast business is easy for people to remember mm-hmm. compared to ATL Web. And I've done a lot of brand mushing up where we've rolled up several brands we at one stage we had internet marketing speed for our blog we had fast web formula for the community atl web for websites seo partner for seo buy with bonus for affiliate stuff we had uh, some domains for sale on a website where we were just selling domains in the end, we just scooped them all up and brought them back to one place, and it was so much easier. So that's another thing. It might be just simpler mm-hmm. for customers to find you and to understand what you do if you have a good name. While we're on this, I've noticed uh, some people come up with objections like, well, all the good names are taken, and I just want to cover that one. And we, we talked about this a little bit in the last episode, uh, actually in episode number three when we're talking about selling a website. There's lots of good domains for sale. Often, you can find a great domain Mm -hmm. that's for sale, and sometimes they might cost one or two or $3,000. However, 
you've got to weigh that up in terms of the long haul for your business. How much is your business worth to you? I mean, we gave that case study where you sold a business for four hundred thousand dollars. A good name is going to be an, a very small part of the overall success of that business in terms of cost, but a big part in terms of how much you could sell it for. Absolutely. The name that I, I picked, which is called marketbeat.com, that name was actually taken. You know, the Wall Street Journal used it for a while. Um, they haven't used the name in over two years. I checked, the name wasn't trademarked, and the domain was for sale on cedo, com. And, you know, I asked my tra- I asked a trademark lawyer, hey, do you think I could use this? You know, it wasn't trademarked and he thought it would be fine if I had the domain and, you know, I should be pretty safe to use it. So uh, I ended up paying $9,500 for the domain. And I think that was, it was a lot, you know, for some people it's a lot of money, but in terms of a business that, you know, does pretty well and I'm going to use the name for probably the next five years, you know, it's a relatively small um, investment into the business, you know, for something that you're going to use forever. It's also a barrier to entry for other people. Some of the people who have to choose crappy domains or go with a domain yep. they register for nine dollars, not going to have the same market presence as as a market beat style domain. I've got lots and lots of two word domains that I have fortunately um, bought well and sold well, and you know they're so brandable and, and it's instantly recognizable about what this domain might be for, and that's why people buy them. There was one that I really wanted to develop out into a Udemy or um, Linda type site called LearnStream. It was such a great two word domain. It really lent itself well to that type of business. So it's you know obvious when you hear about a name like that that, that what it could possibly be, be about you know learning online streaming. So a lot of factors go into coming up with the name, and we've started talking about a few of them. You certainly want to do your checks to make sure that it hasn't been used for something unsavory or bad or that doesn't say something weird when you put the words up. Like therapist it can also be the rapist. Yep. And you might want to trademark your domain if you can and if it hasn't been before once you, once you do it. That's a whole other conversation. But the main point around that is think about what domain is going to serve you well for the next 10 years a lot of people at three in the morning are going to register a domain that might serve them well for one campaign for the next week. Think a little longer term. Think about the long haul. And I know I registered super fast business quite some time back and it's been a brand that has been able to stay with me for a long time and, and can endure, but I should have trademarked it a little earlier. We, we also covered that one in an earlier episode where – other people can come and start using your name if you don't trademark it, especially in different top-level domain variations. If you get a really good domain, it's nice to own several versions of it just to protect your brand, and branding is super important. And if you do have something substantial, it really is worth protecting and perhaps trademarking. So let's talk about what are the steps involved. You're at this point where you had your first domain, which had an unfortunate start in terms of the the name, what it could have spelt out, and you decided you wanted to change it because your customers couldn't figure out what you your brand is, and they, they could never repeat it quite properly. By the way, that used to happen to me with Fast Web Formula, mm. and people couldn't quite figure that one out. So you've decided to make it easier. What sort of steps have you gone through? Yeah, so the first step was to identify the name. You know, I had a list of probably 10 names. You know, I just asked friends, family for, you know, hey, what do you think sounds good? And some of my best customers I, I talked to and asked them, you know, um, after I had, you know, five names, it's like, hey, I'm thinking about switching a name to one of these. What do you like and why? What do you think each one of these means? Um, so I just did some surveying to try to get some better ideas of, you know, what people thought the new brand would mean and, you know, what does this company do? And I, I got some pretty good feedback about Market Beat. There were a couple other names I was considering that uh, were decent names, but when I heard them or or when people kind of thought about what they what those names might mean, you know, they didn't quite make as much sense. So it's, uh, you know, you've got to be really careful about the name you pick and you need to get some good feedback about it. You can't really trust yourself in picking a name. It is something worse. And so many people are going to be interacting with your brand. 
you just need to get that feedback. Yeah, I'll offer a slightly contrarian point of view. I've often found friends and family are the very worst people to ask an opinion for because they just mm-hmm. often cannot relate to what it is that we do. I remember um, going to a meeting with my dad, actually, a lunchtime meeting, and he stood up at the table and he had to introduce his guest, which was me. And he goes, uh, this, this is my son, James. Not exactly sure what he does, but evidently it works out really well for him and it's got something to do with the internet. And then we both sat back down and I just chuckled. You know, it is really hard to explain what we do to the outsider. So if you do get feedback, often it's good to think about your target customer and to see what else has already been successful in the marketplace. And I also remember an episode of Seth Godin's where he was talking about the weirder a name is or the harder it is for people to grasp what it means, the harder it is to get traction in the beginning, but the stronger ownership you have when it does have traction. And you have look a look at a list of words like Yahoo, Amazon, Google, Apple. They all don't really mean that much to a first time listener. However, once you know what it is, they have ownership of that brand. So I think it's okay to have a brandable domain if you want to put some effort into making people know what that actually means over the the long haul. Uh, And that's, you know, don't just buy a domain because it's got keywords in it and you think you're going to pick up search traffic. So I think Market Beat is a great name for what you were doing with that subscription. Yeah, I made the mistake of, you know, buying a keyword domain uh, when it first started. So I called it Analyst Ratings Network. I bought AnalystRatings.net and then I ranked number one for that keyword of Analyst Ratings and it turns out that uh, wasn't a very important keyword and I just didn't get a lot of traffic from it. So there, you know, I was kind of stuck with that domain name even though the reason I bought it, you know, didn't even have much of a business impact. Well, one of the reasons I went with super fast business is I was thinking of that triangle. You know, the one where you can have cheap, good or fast, pick mm-hmm. two. Yep. And uh, I didn't want to be cheap because I just coming from Mercedes Benz, I really don't resonate with the Kia Hyundai philosophy of doing things. You know, so that was out. Definitely wanted to be good and fast. So of those two, I thought fast is good. A lot of people online are, are pressed for time. And business is so general that it was able to capture all of the business units in a nice little grab bag. I didn't want to be too specific. And one of my original companies was uh, called J6 Solutions. Again, Solutions was quite broad, enough to cater for the next 10 years worth of you know, business, whether it was sales training, whether it was website development. It didn't really matter. I could put it all under that because I was solving problems. So don't pen yourself too tightly into a corner. Um, a keyword-rich domain can be a bit restrictive for the long haul. If anything, go a little more general, a little more brandable would be something. So you've picked out a name with your panel of experts. You've decided on it. You've you've approached someone to buy it, no doubt. Yeah. You know, I, I finalized the name. The domain was listed on Cedo for ten grand. Um, the guy didn't seem really wasn't that willing to budge, and I just kind of sucked it up and ended up paying, you know, ninety five hundred dollars for that domain name, which is fine. You know, I made sure that, you know, I could trademark it and that wasn't going to be an issue. I made sure there weren't any existing trademarks for that name um, in the United States, uh, you know, where I live. Then, you know, once the name was kind of finalized, there was a huge process to just kind of move everything over and let customers know. When I made this move, it was only four or five months ago. And I had 200,000 people that got an email from me every day. So if all of a sudden one day they start getting an email from somebody they don't recognize, you know, that could be a lot of people, you know, doing a spam report or unsubscribing or um, so I had to make it very clear that, you know, this was the old name. This is the new name. This is why we were changing it. So, you know, I just really made a big effort to over communicate the change while we did it. And, you know, f- four or five months later now, I still have, you know, a big note on the top of the website saying, hey, we changed the name. We used to be this. Now we're this. This is why. So just over communicating the change if if you're going to do that. Um that, that's a good thing. People don't pay as much attention to your business as you think they do. So you you can't just send one email saying, hey, we changed our name. It should be probably five emails over the course of a couple months and notices all over your website. If you have a newsletter, a notice in there and just make it so people can't miss the name change. Yeah, it's interesting uh, what you said. People don't 
pay as much attention as, as what you do. I've found uh, generally when I want to change a whole website, like when we picked up six websites and moved them to one, mm-hmm. we didn't really need to communicate that much to the customers because I don't think they cared so much with the magic of a 301 search engine friendly redirect. Mm-hmm. If people were clicking on links to the old site, it would transport them to the new page on the new site that had the same information. And it was really interesting when I changed Fast Web Formula across to Super Fast Business. It was a forum. So we just picked up the whole forum, copied it across into the exact same directory. Now, this is a really important thing. If you're going to move stuff around, then I suggest you copy the exact same page structure and directory structure. That makes it really easy to, to send a catch-all redirect to the new site because you can literally copy an entire site across to the new site. Then you just do a redirection of the old site and the corresponding page will go to the corresponding page. If you have forward slash blue on the old domain, then it will go to forward slash blue on the new domain. It makes it a lot easier for the usability. You don't want to cause carnage and chaos for a website by chopping and changing all of your hard-won links and search engine positions. I've still got index pages from my old sites years later because of the 301 search engine-friendly redirect. Um, now, if you've got any comments on that point, I'll, I'll ask you, Matthew, just before I go on to the next point that I wanted to make around this topic. Yeah, I think the, the 301 redirects are big you know, because you know, both for SEO reasons and for you know, if you have old links floating out there, you know, as I did, you know, when somebody clicks on the link in a newsletter they sent, you know, we sent out six months ago, you know, we still want that link to go to the right place. And I think that's, you know, hugely important if you're switching websites. Yeah. And so my next point on this, which is similar, is you can then just go and modify your send from addresses in your autoresponder systems, et cetera. I do have a little notice in my fast web formula community and it just says hey if you ever see fast web formula that's what this place used to be called because you've got to keep in mind that it's only really going to affect people who knew you up until the point of the change after the point of change there'll be so many new people that it's not going to mean anything to them so don't overcook the warnings or the messages keeping in mind once you've fully informed everyone who was there then It's like a new start. It really is like a fresh beginning. The interesting thing that I found of all the brands I moved, and there's probably about eight, there's one brand people keep talking about and keep mentioning to the point where we've recently re-established a site on that domain because they still refer to SEO Partner. It's the strangest thing. We Mm. haven't had it for years. People still talk about our SEO Partner services. So we've done something similar to what you did with market beat is we've created a news source we've created an industry news site and we simply put banners that redirect people to our products page and our goal is to build up the industry news source for wholesale seo resellers so people who sell services but don't provide the services uh, or you know, do them in house. They should be getting the news from us, and then they'll be redirected to where they can buy wholesale services. And so that's pretty much the brand dictating that it's so strong it deserves its own entity. So why do you think that name, you know, kept in, you know, got stuck in people's minds when they just kind of forgot about other names? It's such a good name because it says what it does. It's both sure. brandable and easy to understand. It's got SEO in the words, so it's very clearly delineated. It's got partner in the name and that says, hey, we'll do this with you. And being a wholesale provider, it's really easy for people to get it. Hey, these guys can partner with us and we can go out and help customers. So because of the way that that it went, and it, it wasn't always like that. It wasn't always positioned as a wholesale vendor. It just became the wholesale vendor. Went through this crazy phase. In the beginning, there was just two packages then we ended up expanding up to six or seven and then 10 and then we went back down to three or four, our core packages. And then we went more from retail to wholesale because of the side thing we were talking about in the episode number four about growing your business around the same customer. Well, our coaching community customers 
are often resellers and they always need products and services to resell. So it turned out that I'd created my own customer base for this wholesale vendor business and yeah, it just it's a sticky, sticky name and uh, a great name. And I ended up – I originally bought that for $500 on GoDaddy auctions and created that business live in a workshop called – was this one called? It was called Business Internet Formula. It was my fourth workshop that I'd run. And I created this business from scratch in the workshop live. We recorded it. The recordings are still inside the Super Fast Business membership. That business went on to become a seven figure per year business in its own right. And it was born in this live case study. The domain was just a winner. It really is a good domain. So there you go. Uh, sometimes. Your customers will really drive the direction by showing you they just don't get what you do or they totally get what you do. So what sort of challenges are there with name changes? Did you find things that happened that you weren't expecting? Yeah, I was a couple of things. One is it seemed to be kind of a, you know, it's something when you're preparing for it, you think it's going to be a big deal. You're going to get a lot of feedback about a lot of comments and, you know, it just turns out your customers don't tend to care that much. You know, they're like, oh, okay, new name, got it. And you're not going to get a lot of feedback about it either way. A couple of people said, hey, nice name change, but that's about it. And, you know, after I made the change, the business kind of just went on as normal. Um, so it's something you think is going to be a big thing and ends up not being a big thing in the short term, you know, immediately after it happens. Yeah, I'm um, so not scared of changing names. The sort of reaction I get from members is like, oh, cool. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> much it. The other thing is... Uh, well, you know, if you're gonna well, I didn't know you do that. Yeah. You know, because I now put everything on one thing. Oh, I didn't even know you did that because I had these partitioned businesses yep. and brought them all together. This made sense in hindsight. The best solutions are always simple in hindsight. I think that's the LA Gold Rat saying. Mm -hmm. They're always obvious in hindsight. Yeah. The other thing is that you know, if you're going to do um, switch domain names, you know that it can take if, even if you do a three hundred one redirect, right? It, it still takes Google a few weeks to kind of realize that, you know, you switch domains and all that stuff has happened. And you can tell them that you're switching domains. But, you know, for me, I, I probably took a two, three, four week dip in traffic um, when I made that change. And I kind of knew it was coming. I didn't know what the scale would be, but it's something you have to be aware of and kind of prepare for. And you also have to see what sort of reputation the domain you want to move to has. Like you, you will transfer your page rank and you will transfer backlinks, but you want to also pay attention to what's already pointing to that thing if it's had a tarnished reputation or been blacklisted maybe it was used in part of a blog network and it's been toxic or you know fingerprinted by all these tools that say oh in a bad domain bad neighborhood etc and how do we do this well um, one thing is you can type site colon and then the domain name and see what's pointing to it how many pages are indexed to it sorry once you hook it up to Google Webmaster Tools, you might get a little peek at what's pointing to it and you can use other tools like Majestic SEO or ahrefs.com to see what's going on or SEMrush. Uh, these tools should give you a bit of a picture as to what's happening with that domain. Google aren't going to update PageRank anymore, so you mightn't see it in your browser, but you know you might get a feel for some historical value for it. But the main thing is you just want to to check that it is actually indexed. If your site's not indexed at all, that could be a big indicator there's a problem. In the old days, you'd have a grayed out page rank bar. But these days, you know, point your domain to a server, put up an yep. index.html or index.php page and put some text, you know, like new site and see if it pops up and gets indexed. If you, if you get indexed, then it's probably going to be fine. And I think you can actually submit to Google Webmaster Tools a reconsideration request. I've had domains knocked off and then restored when I've sent them an explanation. You know, like when uh, there was one domain which had been – I'd purchased and for some reason just was not showing up and I'd installed a software app onto this domain and I put in a Google reconsideration request, showed them, you know, that, that this is a legit domain and – Here's, here's how it serves people and they restored it and it popped back up straight away. It was really good. Yeah. Um, it's important to know that, you know, a manual penalty like that from Google is not the end of the world. 
I've gotten a couple of them on my sites for just kind of random reasons. And, you know, if you fix whatever they tell you to fix and, you know, you remove the bad pages they don't want, you send a reconsideration request, you almost always get it taken care of. It's a bad deal, but it's not like the end of the world. Yeah, just don't, don't you know, don't fly into a big name change onto some corrupt domain. So just put it up first, mm-hmm. see that it's good, and then switch it across. Um, if you want to get a feel for what a prices might be on a domain, there's a great website called DN Sale Price. And I don't think it's updated anymore, but it certainly has a good historical record of stuff up up to probably 2013. And just you can punch in a couple of t- two-word domains and most of them are going to give you a range of, of prices. Often they're in the two or $3,000 price range. I think I've talked about uh, the process of how you can save money buying domains in one of the other podcasts. But often if a domain is listed for sale, like the person's actively trying to sell it, you can go through a negotiation process. And one of the keys is to not make a ridiculously low, silly offer. I think it's not respectful of people to make a lowball offer. If, you've, if you're looking at a $5,000 domain, sending a $50 offer is just insulting. You wouldn't send anything less than $1,000 for a domain like that. And often you'll be able to pick it up for two or $3,000 if they're asking mm-hmm. five or $1,000 if they're asking two, for example. Often 50% is good. But if you, have, if you find a great domain and someone really knows it, you're going to be paying pretty close to what they're asking for. So other challenges, let's see. You've changed the name of your business. You've told the customers who used to deal with the old brand. From the new day forward, everyone new only knows the new one, so that's pretty easy. You've checked the reputation. You've protected yourself uh, with some kind of a a trademark if possible. And uh, now Mm -hmm. it's just a matter of... um, uh, often you'll you'll do a design upgrade as well. I think that's sort of an important aspect. If you're going to change the domain and you get a fresh start, you might as well look at things like uh, how you want to be perceived in the market. Your logo might get a, an update and your um, your design of the, the website and your materials should all probably be redone with a style guide. And that would be a, a, a guideline as to what your colors are, the, the look and feel of your website and every document you do, whether it's a website, an email, a PDF, should all follow the style guideline. And I learned this sort of stuff from a big brand like Mercedes-Benz who are so active in preserving their reputation. Their brand quality is preserved through very strict guidelines on how that brand can be used. Like you must have the words a certain distance from the star. There must be nothing within a certain distance of the star and the words, for example. They're really, really fussy, but it certainly shows because it's one of the top two brands in the world probably. Absolutely, yeah. We did a new logo when we changed the name of our business. Um, you know, I paid an agency to do that and do it right. And the logo we came out with is, is pretty simple, but it works and I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. The other, you know, one other mistake that I made when doing the switch was I had kind of forgotten to tell the, you know, my business partners that we were changing the name. So there were, you know, a couple of advertising agencies that, you know, I do business with and, you know, they found out when everyone else did. And it probably would have been a good idea to give them some heads up saying, hey, we're going to do this, you know, on this date. So you, know, you should probably tell your advertisers that's happening too. And I just kind of forgot to do that. So it's important to, you know, like who else, you know, what other companies interact with this website and, you know, do, you know, they probably need to know too and ahead of time. Yeah, that is important. And, and so everyone on the team, any stakeholder who you deal with would be good. There are other little side complexities. If you are rolling together a few brands like I've done, so we've got two slightly different case studies here. We've got one with just a straight name swap. The other way you're porting a few different things together. It can change the way you have navigation on your site. When I had standalone brands, because they were single products mostly, they mostly had the sales offer at the homepage. And when I switched to an all-in-one, then I had to come up with a new way to navigate through products. And we use what's called a product chooser, where people can navigate quickly to the part of the website that they need. So each segment of the website effectively became a mirror of what used to be on the old website, but it had a front layer put on top. So give some thought to it, but keep it as simple as you possibly can. That's really the overriding factor. The, the, just to recap, 
it's simply finding a better name than what you have. You're making sure everyone involved is informed about it. It's having a little timeline, a process of how you might go about the logistics, which will be setting up the new thing and then pointing everything across, letting everyone know. And then that's probably a good time to start doing your uh, attending your analytics and checking things like your rankings and your traffic and how people navigate through your site and how they're responding to the brand. And after a small settling in period, you're probably better off for the whole experience. I wonder if there's anything else we should talk about for this episode. You know, I, I just think you've done a really good job of communicating. You know, you, you brought four or five things under one domain name. And it's still pretty easy to navigate to, you know, understand what you offer and what the various options are. And I just think that serves as a, as a good example of what people can do when they're trying to offer, you know, four or five services at once. Yeah, it's 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 really hard to simplify the complex, <laughs> but I think with uh, we've had a, a fairly interesting process through that journey. Uh, well, thank you also for the feedback. I did hire an expert on conversions at one point to help me reorganize a little bit and that was pep liar and he's from Con- conversion excel and he basically gave me some really good feedback on how to navigate people through to where they're going he talked to me about this idea of pogo sticking which is when you you know originally the way we approached it was to put our brands on our master website and people would click on them and then he said well they don't really know what your brand is so they have to click on it to find out and if they don't if it's not what they thought it is, then they go back and that's called pogo sticking. So now we changed it to customer facing wording like help me with my website. I need more traffic uh, and coaching products. We actually changed I want coaching to coaching products because the products navigation tab on my website is the one that lights up like a Christmas tree on our heat maps. People want to know what I've got. So they're clicking on that products tab and when people click on the products tab, we do our very best to help them find the right section and we've color-coded the sections. The colors run right through that section. If they go into the website section, for example, it's purple and all the options in the website are purple so that they can get a sense for where they are within the website. And over a lot of iterations i think we're up to about our eighth version of the website and we've got the next one coming through soon we're trying to just remove elements simplify and we focus really heavily on our navigation with heat maps and with google analytics we want to get someone where they need to be quickly and easily so that they get the most value from their visit and it's such a fascinating thing in fact it's If someone has multiple products and they're trying to sell them, I would highly recommend getting the Own the Race course theme. We actually sell our theme. There's an ad for it on our sidebar because so many people have thought, well, you know what? He spent all this time and effort to figure it out. We'll just copy it. (laughs) And uh, so we just make it. It even comes with sales page templates built in and it's a fast start at least to something that converts. So... Use the opportunity when you're changing your name to rethink about every aspect of your business. Question everything. Is what we were doing before the right way? If our name wasn't perfect, I wonder if our website's ideal. I wonder if our logo needs a rejig. I wonder if we could do something a bit cleaner or smarter on the next one. And that's pretty much our default position is we question everything on an ongoing basis and that's how we keep iterating. And Peter Drucker said, that the, the, the key to success in business is marketing and innovation. So a name change is such a great innovation. Use it as an opportunity to leap forward in more than just a small increment. Make it a big leap forward. Matthew, I think we've probably covered this subject of successfully changing your name in uh, business. I think one one other aspect we didn't really talk about is the personal business things, you know, like uh, a lady who might get married and then say, hey, what name should I be using now? Those sort of things can be challenges as well. I mm-hmm. uh, don't know if you've encountered that, but I've certainly seen discussions along those lines before in my own community. Some people choose their middle name from the beginning so that they could just build out a brand around their first and second name. 
and that way it's going to be interchangeable or a lot of women these days don't change their name when they get married. So there's those possibilities. Yeah, there was a entrepreneur I know that uh, had a divorce recently and, you know, she's a woman and uh, she had to, you know, decide whether or not she's going to keep, you know, her married name or go back to her maiden name because everyone knows her as her married name and that definitely can be an issue. Yeah, so, you know, both you and I are a little more in favor of business names for things that we might want to sell or or distance ourselves from at some point um, in a good way, not in a bad way, not because we don't like it, but because maybe Mm -hmm. we change it. One of the reasons I really never developed my own domain name is I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. So maybe, maybe one day I won't be in the internet business space. I might be a surfboard design company or whatever. I I do have a surfboard design business, uh, but it's, it's only in its very infancy, but you know, think long term. That's really a message that I'd like to come through from this podcast. Think long term. Think very carefully about what name you want and commit to it for a while, unless you get strong feedback that it's not getting you the results that you are hoping for. Right. So uh, let's wrap up this episode, Matthew, because we still have part six coming up, which is a very exciting one. It's website monetization tips. And that will be a great way to end this six-part uh, series of business case studies. And I uh, look forward to catching up with you on that one, Matthew. Now, if you want to check out what Matthew's got going on, head over to mattpolson.com. That's two Ts, P-A-U-L-S-O-N. And that will guide you to his various uh, interests in the online space. Yeah, I think uh, you guys should definitely stick around for episode six of the series. Somebody just paid me a thousand dollars for one hour of my time to, you know, help them monetize their website better. Um, you know, just moving ads around, picking different networks, you know, optimizing just placements can have a huge impact. And I think we're going to double this guy's ad revenue from you know maybe three or four grand to seven or eight grand overnight just by moving stuff around and optimizing things. So uh, it's uh, you know if you've got a website with traffic, it's definitely an episode to listen to. Looking forward to that one, Matthew. Speak soon. Thanks, James. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Thank you.